Hey, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our first event at the Falk Auditorium at Brookings, and I'm so glad we're doing it for this event. My name is Amy Liu, and I'm vice president here at Brookings, and I lead Brookings Metro. And it's a real pleasure to just have you be with us this afternoon on such an important topic, and to have the smell of popcorn <laughs> be in the backdrop with us as well. Um, we are here because this is the last uh, day of uh, Fair Chance Month, and we really wanted to use this opportunity to make sure we are truly committed to the opportunity of fair chance, second chances for Ameri many of our Ameri community members. And what you're going to have today is an important screening um, from a TEDx uh, San Quentin talk that our colleague Annalise Goger was part of, uh, Goger was part of, with uh, about 20 other speakers. And um, you're going to get to hear from four, four of them today, a series of really inspiring uh, stories that I hope they'll motivate all of us to do more on this topic. And um, I'm very much looking forward to this conversation today. Um, my job primarily today, besides welcoming all of you, is to bring the we real welcomer to today's conversation, and that is B. Welters. Uh, B. Welters is a member of the Brookings Board of Trustees, a longtime supporter of the institution and our program, but more importantly, she is our conscious. She's been a real advocate of making sure Brookings and our program remains very proximate to the issues that we care about as we focus on much more racially inclusive, sustainable, prosperous communities. And um, it, she has just been a mentor and a friend to all of us. And, I, and as you hear from her in a moment, you'll see why she is the right person to introduce this topic because of her own personal commitment to young people and to a fair and just society. And with that, let me introduce B. Welters. Okay. Good afternoon. Again, my name is Beatrice Welters, and I am a member of the Brookings Board of Trustees. I also have a master's degree in criminal justice from John Jay School of Criminal Justice in New York, where I focused on juveniles in the criminal justice system. My passion for supporting young people led my husband and I to create the Ambrose Foundation with the goal of cultivating young minds from under-resourced and challenging environments to lead lives of personal and professional success. We also created the Ambrose Foundation um, with the goal of... Uh, well, we also created the Ambrose uh, Scholars Program at NYU Law School, the undergraduate school at NYU, and also the undergraduate school at Notre Dame University, where both my sons graduated. These scholarships support students who are among the first in their families to pursue undergraduate and graduate or professional degrees. And so this topic of criminal justice and justice reform is something, something that deeply resonates with me. I am very pleased to welcome you to this special screening of TEDx San Quentin, Challenging Fears After Prison, in which a panel of national thought leaders discuss the key obstacles that individuals face upon leaving prison and transitioning back to their communities and what can be done to ease this transition. We are fortunate that Annalise Gozier, one of the TEDx speakers, is here with us today. And I don't see Annalise. Oh, there she is, right there. <laughs> Annalise is a former Rubenstein Fellow who now dedicates her time at Brookings Metro to developing policy innovations that will help overlooked workers access good jobs in today's digital economy. In the film, Annalise discusses how virtual reality technologies can be used to support the education and rehabilitation of prisoners through real-world simulation. This is a project she has been working on with former Rubenstein Fellow Rayshawn Ray, who is now a senior fellow in the Brookings Governance Studies Program. And just today, I believe, 
he became the recipient of the Andrew Carnegie Fellowship from Carnegie um, Corp of New York. So congratulations, Rayshon. I know he's not here, but tell him I said congratulations. <laughs> After the screening, Annalise will facilitate a fireside chat with Marcus Bullock, an entrepreneur and justice reform advocate, and Connor Paulson, okay, the lead research assistant to Rayshon's virtual reality lab at the University of Maryland. They will discuss innovative tools that help incarcerated people stay connected to their families and build community, as well as scale access to reentry services and educational opportunities before and after release. They will also take questions from the audience. While we are discussing this technology today in the context of returning citizens, it is important to note that virtual reality could be used in a number of situations, other situations including helping workers of color get a fair chance at new careers and earnings. It is one of the many activities that Brookings Metro is working on in its effort to promote economic prosperity, equity, and inclusion for people of color. Our goal is to offer new research and promising solutions to chart a more hopeful shared future. With the full endorsement of President John Allen and the Brookings Board, I would like to thank Annalise, Rayshawn, Camille Bousset, Richard Reeves, Carol Graham, Andre Perry, and the many other Brookings scholars for dedicating their scholarly work to removing the racial disparities that continue to exist in so many aspects of our society. But I would be remiss not to mention Amy Liu, who is Vice President of Brookings Institution and the Director of Brookings Metro. Her leadership is outstanding. Her leadership is outstanding. So thank you, and now on with the show. Growing up on the South Side of Chicago and back in the yards was very rough. But I have to admit, my friends and I would often make decisions, impetuous and risk-taking decisions that would make it even more difficult. For example, in the summer of 1987, at age 11, my friends and I decided we we're going to go on a little adventure. On this day, we decided that we we're going to go and retrieve a gun from beneath the porch of a friend's house. And days before, we had just joined the gang. And as if that wasn't adventurous enough, when I arrived there at the back porch of my friend's house, I remember reaching beneath the, the, the porch, pulling out a black bag, looking inside and seeing a big giant frightening looking weapon. Too scary for us to pick up. But lying next to it was a 22 Smith & Wesson Long. It looked like a Yosemite Sam gun. It's the first thing I said, Yosemite Sam, my friends laughed because I picked it up and I began to twirl it about. Though nervous, I was trying to impress my friends. My other friend grabbed it and did the same, we were joking. Within a moment, suddenly the gun went off. Boom. The bullet hit me in my face and knocked my head against the garage door. I remember in that moment coming in and out of slow motion and darkness. I remember feeling a very sharp, piercing sensation shooting through my face. And I remember I couldn't see out of my left eye. And I heard a loud bzzz. The bullet entered beneath my left eye. So if you see a dimple, it's not a dimple. The bullet hit and it, sh and it shattered the bone and set fragments in every direction. It lodged behind my left ear and it dam damaged my retina. I remember my friend who had shot me, dropping the gun and grabbing me instantly. My other friends doing the same, saying, you're going to be okay. The little consciousness that I remembered and what I appreciated most is they never left my side. I remember them walking me to my other friend's house, Pito's house. When we got there, his mother was horrified. She said, oh my God. And she said, pinche gangueros, because she knew that we were already involved in gangs. I just thought for certain I was going to die. When the ambulance arrived, I remember them putting me on a gurney at a slight slant. And they kept saying, don't lay him all the way down because we don't choke him on his blood. Interesting, by that time, I was already swallowing my blood. I thought for some reason that 
by swallowing my own blood, it will stop me from bleeding to death. I never forget the technician standing above me with a big giant needle and I looked up and I said, are you gonna give me a shot? She said, no worries, Xavier, I already gave you a shot. Apparently at that point, it damaged my nerves so badly that I had lost all sensation on the left side of my face. And it's funny, I had just been shot in my face that I was afraid of a needle, you know? I was shot in my face, but I was afraid of a needle. <clears throat> I remember being in the ambulance and the officer stepping in saying, who shot you? <clears throat> and I remember looking up and looking at him, I said nothing at first, he said, who shot you? And all my life I've been raised and told, you don't tell on people, especially not your friends. And with it, without a moment of thought and much time to consider, I just made up a story. I said, a man in a black car. I just made up a story. I remember arriving at the hospital, and while this was happening, my friends were being interrogated back at the police station. But amid all of the chaos, we didn't have a chance to come up with a story. We didn't have a script. And one of my friends, he told the truth. He just figured it was an accident. My friend shot my other friend by accident. He didn't think anyone would get into trouble, but he was wrong. The police ended up locking up my best friend for my attempted murder, along with another friend. I remember getting out of the hospital, my mother coming to get me. In complete embarrassment, my mother, you know, God bless her soul, she arrived eager to bring me home, but didn't bring any clothes. And I remember that ride home on the CTA bus heading home with blood crust clothing, looking like a monster to people around me. I remember how quickly I ran to the streets because despite the dangerousness of having almost lost my life, the gang was the only real love that I had felt at that point. And while walking through my neighborhood in this vulnerable state, the police officers drove up and they said, what's up, Speedy? And I just stopped because I knew the routine. They're gonna jump out the car, shake me down, and send me on my way. But instead on this day, they said, hop in the back seat of the car, Speedy. Hop in the back seat. And so I went in the back seat of the car and I remember sitting there and I said, what, what's going on? Why, why, why are you arresting me? What's happening? They said, you're getting locked up, Speedy. I was like, for what? He said, for obstruction of justice. I was like, obstruction of justice? I'm 11 years old. Of course, I didn't know what he meant when he said obstruction of justice. While in the police station, they told me, Xavier, you're going to go to detention. I was like, detention? And I had never been there before. I remember arriving there at intake and there the nurse assessing my wounds, seeing if I can bear with what I was going to go through, whether I should be locked away and kept from the other kids or placed on a normal section. And for me, never being able to be vulnerable and express what I was going through, I often would say, I'm okay, I'm all right, I'm fine. And I convinced the nurse that I can go in the section with the other kids. So the following day, I found myself on section. And while sitting there in the best seat in a TV room across from the television with the remote and changing it as I pleased. And uh, without moment's notice, a kid who had came in from school walked up to me and said, get up out that seat, bro. And I looked up to him and I said, what? And he said, get up out that seat. You're in my seat. He saw that I was physically vulnerable. And I remember one of the older gang members that told me, he said, if anyone ever tries to disrespect you or tries to take something from you in prison, don't say nothing. Just swing. And I remember jumping up and swinging with all my might. And I remember hitting him. And I remember opening my eyes and he was still there. You know, like, was a, you know, like <laughs> it was no win. You know, the kid was bigger than me and he beat me into the television. They broke us up and separated us with single swipes, grabbed me and threw me to solitary confinement at the back of the section. Me and him, cell next to cell. I was in there breathing hard, as looking in this dingy mirror, trying to assess my scars to see if they got worse. Discover I had a busted mouth along with all the, other, all the other physical trauma. But I will never forget the feeling when I was told that I was not gonna be leaving that cell anytime soon. I'll never forget the inability to really wrap my mind around them telling me I was in solitary confinement and that at the very young age of 11 years old, I would not be able to have human contact. And for an 11 year old child to be in that place physically vulnerable already, emotionally torn, and understand for me, not understanding what my charges were, 
in my mind, I'm locked up for my own shooting. Understand that. And after days there, I finally was able to show up before a judge. And when he looked at us, he didn't see children. He didn't see us as kids. He gave us a year of probation and sent us along our way. There was no talk of trauma of me being a gunshot victim. No talk of the trauma of my friends witnessing it. Back in the 80s, there, there was no talk about adverse childhood experiences. And so for them, when they saw us, they saw criminals, miniature adults, having experienced it. I had no trust for the system. And again, I ran back to my gang. By the time I was 13 years old, I had 19 arrests and seven convictions for armed robberies, aggravated assaults, weapon charges. For things I look back now to these adults, and it's hard for me to wrap my mind around those things. How can a child be involved in that? Mm, my final charge at the age of 13 was for the loss of another child's life in my community. And his name was Pedro Martinez. <clears throat> Although I did not physically kill Pedro, I was the one that was on security across the street with a weapon in my pocket looking towards 50th and Loomis. And I saw him turn the corner. I remember alerting my gang because we had just been shot at earlier that day. In fact, it was a normal occurrence. And what I thought would be a threat was really a 14-year-old child. And on that day, he was lured into an abandoned building where he was killed. He didn't deserve to die. <clears throat> I remember running home that night, crying and asking God to forgive me, forgive me. I remember laying on the couch and I couldn't sleep, and I just kept praying, God, please forgive me. But no matter how much I pray, I couldn't forgive myself. Days later, I was arrested and charged with murder. The police came first to arrest me because my brother had told them about weapons I had hidden in my mother's home. And when they came, they arrested me, and they grabbed the weapons, and they said, you're not going to get out for a very long time. And I knew that, but they knew something else that I didn't know, and that is that I was wanted for murder. On Monday morning, I stepped into the courtroom and they said, Xavier, you're released. I said, released? They said, yeah, you're released to homicide. I was like, homicide? And I looked behind me, and there was two detectives with cuffs waiting to apprehend me. And they walked up and gently put the cuffs on my back, and they walked me out of that courtroom. I arrived at the homicide unit there, and while in that police station, I remember the officers first very nicely asking me, do you remember where you were at on October 28th? The night of October 28th, do you remember where you were at? I said, no, I don't remember. I have no idea. And then all the officers came running with a telephone book and he struck me in my face. For almost an hour and a half, they were choking me, hitting me with a telephone book, threatening me, and they convinced me that it was over. And when I tried, even as a 13-year-old child, to tell my simple truth, my role in it, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough that I was outside the building when it happened. They wanted me to place myself inside that building. And when they beat me into that confession, I remember arriving there at the Audi home. And while there, being placed inside to confinement again, because I couldn't be along with the other kids, I remember being in that space and telling myself my life's over. I went to the adult criminal court uh, and there they gave me a 25 year sentence. And that was a call of mercy on, on the behalf of my judge. Literally, because my public defender fought for me. I ended up serving 13 years in prison. And while there, I changed my life. And since then, I have lived out my eternal apology to Pedro, I lived out my paternal apology to his family, my, my family, and those I had harmed in the community growing up. I, I ended up earning an Associate of Arts, an Associate in General Education, a bachelor's degree in Social Science, had a 4.0 GPA, 
was inducted into the Franklin Honor Society for Outstanding Scholarship, all while behind bars. And I came out at age 26 with a remorseful heart and a mission and desire to make a difference in my community, to fight for marginalized, disregarded, and forgotten children who were just like me. And I've done that work for the past 20 years now. I've been out for 20 years, y'all. And today I'm 46 and I'm able, <laughs> I'm able to stand here now as a father as, and also a co-executive director at the Campaign for the Fair Sentencing of Youth. And I advocate on behalf of kids who are given extreme sentences because of the same outmoded, uncaring thinking about children that was imposed upon me. And I often think back upon my life and I ask myself, what could have made a difference in my life? What could have really made a difference? I was not really a bad child. No child's born bad. And I always remind myself very gently that Xavier, it's only because they didn't see you as a child. They never saw you as a child, let alone, let alone as a victim. And I'm convinced in this work as an advocate for, for kids who have been discarded by society that sadly we have not gone very far from that way of treatment of kids since the time of the 80s and 90s when they were calling us super predators. According to a study conducted by the Office of Juvenile Justice and the Delinquency Pre Prevention, more than 90% of kids in the justice system have experienced two or more ACEs, that is adverse childhood experiences. And our only response to those traumas or the manifestation of those traumas have been to lock them in, sh in shackles, place them in handcuffs, put them in solitary confinement, and sentence them to life without the possibility of parole. There are people in this room right now who went through that shit. And I feel you. And this is our truth. Denying the rights of, of children, the human rights of children, is a hallmark of the American criminal justice system. And it is extremely disproportionate and brutal in this treatment of black children. We are the only country in the world that sentences children to life without the possibility of parole. And that sentence is mostly reserved for who? Black children who have experienced the most severe exposures to trauma. But I'm proud to say that there are many in this room and many across this country who despite the imposition of extreme sentences and thankfully to the jurisprudence of the Supreme Court and recognizing the neuroscience and recognizing the impacts of trauma and the staunch advocacy of people who refuse to settle for less for America's children, more than 800 people across this country have been released who are condemned to die in prison as children. You cannot stop the humanity that's within us. You cannot strip our soul. We are human beings. We're not inmates, we're not offenders, we're not cons nor ex-cons. We are fathers, photographers, artists, tech experts. We are people who have such great capacity to do amazing things if given a chance. And my only hope for this TED Talk, honestly, that people if they ever see on the news and hear of a child having committed a serious violent offense, I only hope that this TED Talk will help people not ask the question, is that child a monster? But instead to ask the question, who or what could have possibly failed this child so badly they may have never had a chance in the first place? Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.
One of my best friends from college, I'll call her Rachel, had what seemed to be a picture-perfect life. She had a rewarding career as a teacher. Her husband was an Ivy League professor, and they just had a baby. But then one day, I got a call from a mutual friend, and I could tell from the tone in her voice that she was about to tell me some bad news. So I stopped on the sidewalk and prepared myself. It's Rachel, she said. The baby was crying nonstop, and she had bruises all over her body. So she took her to the doctor, and they found that she had broken bones in most multiple places in her body. Eventually, her husband admitted that he had done this to the baby. So we were horrified and shocked that he would do this to them. And I was irate when the sentence came down. And he got one year of house arrest and five years of supervised visitation. One year of house arrest. And I was angry for two reasons. One, because I felt like he was getting off easy. I wanted him to be punished for what he had done. And second, I wondered if he wasn't a white man if he wasn't an Ivy League professor, would he have gotten the sentence? Young black men are arrested every day for far less. In fact, on average, they get sentences that are 20% longer. And I'm still angry about this injustice, and that's one of the reasons why I continue to work in this area today. But I've changed my perspective on punishment. I've come to realize that fixating on punishment alone would have undermined my friend's healing and the well-being of the baby, who is now grown into a healthy teenager. Because he was able to keep working and support them, she didn't lose the house, and they were able to have financial stability. And because my friend advocated to have the visitation happen in a therapist's office, he actually had more accountability because he had to come face to face with all the impacts of what he did. And so today, I believe that our criminal justice system needs to have a more holistic focus on accountability, healing, and rehabilitation, and not just a narrow focus on punishment. Now, there's a lot of pieces of this reform that I could talk about today, but I'm gonna zoom in on the transition from prison to employment partly because I'm an employment and training specialist, and so this is one of the ways in which I feel I can have the best contribution. But also because getting a job is the best thing we can do to set someone up for success and to reduce recidivism. So it makes us all safer. Today, I'm gonna talk with you about how the system works, and then I'm gonna share three key obstacles and a solution for each. In the United States today, over two million people are incarcerated at any given time. That's the highest in the world, and we also have the highest rate in the world. Our incarceration rate puts us next to countries like Rwanda that have a history of genocide. Compared to our peer countries that are industrialized wealthy nations in the OECD, our incarceration rate is 4.8 times higher. In addition, we have increased the incarcerated population by 500%. Now to me, this says, this is not a natural outcome. This is a cultural choice. This is a policy choice, and we can change it. But we have to really be cognizant that this system is deeply ingrained in long histories of racial segregation and inequality. Today, one in three black boys is likely to be in prison in their lifetime, and one in 17 white boys. And this inequality comes in at every stage, whether it's who is arrested, how long a sentence is, or what someone experiences when they come out. So we have to put race at the center of this reform if we're ever to really change it. 
This system costs us $80 billion a year, and it has very mixed results in terms of whether it actually reduces crime. We release about 650,000 people every year into our communities, but within three years, two thirds of those people will have been rearrested. So we have a cycle going on here and we're not breaking it. Getting a job is the best thing you can do to set someone up for success, but at any given time, around 60% of people who have a record are not stably employed. So I'm gonna go into some obstacles here to that employment. And the first one, is the scale of access to re-entry support and education. So not only do we spend very, very little on re-entry support and education for those who are incarcerated, but also that spending is extremely haphazard. So whether you have access to anything at all could vary tremendously from one place to the other. But it's not as if we don't have programs that are really promising. Right here in San Quentin, there's a program called Prison to Employment Connection, and they've managed to bring recidivism down to only 1%. Now compare that to the 67%, and it's a pretty dramatic difference. But again, the problem is, this program to date has only served about 300 people. So overall, it ends up being a really tiny little drop in the bucket. So the question is, how do you scale this access to this curricula to a lot more people? My colleague, Dr. Rishan Ray, and I believe that you can use new technologies like virtual reality to make that curricula available to a lot more people. So the idea is we would bring programs like the curricula for a prison to employment connection into the VR environment, and then we would test it to make sure it works well, and then bring it to scale. We like virtual reality because it doesn't require an internet connection. So for those who are still inside, it gets around some of the security concerns. It's also relatively cheap to get a set of goggles. So how it would work is like this. You rent the goggles from a cart in the library, and then you might have access to a job interview, like you'll see here on the screen, like a mock interview. Or you could have mentoring sessions with someone who's in a particular industry who can share with you very specific tips about how to get into that industry with a record. And that could go all the way up to a more structured educational class, like getting a GED, getting a bachelor's degree, or even doing the educational portion of an apprenticeship, which allows the learner to earn while they learn. Right now, we're working with Marcus Bullock of FlickShop who has started his own business school based on his own experience being incarcerated. And we want to bring his curricula into the VR environment and test it in different regions. We're looking for partnership support to begin to expand this project right now. The second barrier that maybe you haven't thought of is red tape. So if you've ever been to the DMV, you may have an inkling of what I'm talking about here, but you wait two hours in line, you get to the front, and then you're missing a document. And so then you have to go find the document. You take that experience and multiply it by about 20, because someone coming out of prison is going to be looking to, for support getting housing, maybe some career services, maybe some transportation to get to the job, and maybe enrolling in health insurance. These are all actually separate agencies, and right now you have to apply for these things separately. And many people can't find their birth certificate or their social security card. So this becomes a huge barrier that people get buried under at a really critical point. When they first come out, they should be focusing on getting to reconnect with their family, reconnect with their network and build that life. But they're getting buried in red tape. So the solution that I propose is that we issue a state ID to everyone before they're released. And moreover, that we enroll them in any programs that they're eligible for before their release. Now, this sounds kind of simple and you know, straightforward, but actually, it's a lot of work that has to go in the background. One, because those systems, some of them are 40 years old. They don't talk to each other. Second, because 88% of people are in state-run prisons. You could pass a federal rule, but you'd have to implement that rule 50 separate times, and you're talking about the technology, redesigning the process. So we need to do the work on the back end to make it easier on the front end. And the last obstacle that I'll share with you today is where you and I come in on the outside, and that's stigma. Now, stigma shows up in the prison to employment process 
in two key ways. One is in the hiring process, and another is in the professional networks. But before I get into that, I want to point out that racial stereotypes and stereotypes about criminality are deeply interconnected. So in the cities that have passed ban the box laws, which prohibit an employer from asking if someone has a record in the initial application, researchers have found that that actually increased racial discrimination. And that's because people are using race as a proxy for having a record. So these are really difficult, tricky issues to disentangle. The solution is what people in the reentry community call proximity. So this means get beneath the label, get beyond the stereotype, and get to know the person. For example, if you, instead of excluding someone in a blanket exclusion of anyone who has a record, look at the job that you're hiring for ahead of time and identify what types of records are, are and aren't acceptable for it. For example, if you're trying to hire for a driver, you wouldn't want someone with a DUI, but another kind of record would probably be fine. Also, in the interview process, if you find out someone does have a record, ask them to show you evidence of their rehabilitation. And if they can show you that, then that's probably a much better determination of what they would be like as an employee than whether or not they have a record. Professional networks come in because most people get a job through someone they know. And yet, when you're coming out of prison, you actually have a pretty weak network, so you're at a disadvantage from the beginning. This is Shelley Winner. After being incarcerated for about a year and a half on a drug charge, she was applying for a position at the corporate offices in Microsoft, and there were concerns about her record. She told me when we were doing an event at Brookings with her that it wasn't because of her skills that she was ultimately hired. It was because there was a mid-level manager there who vouched for her. He took the time to get to know her, and when they questioned her record, he stood up for her. So there's a lot that we can all do to get to know someone and vouch for them at the right time, or to volunteer at your local reentry organization and be a mentor to someone, be a network for someone. To sum it up, I want to return back to my friend's ex-husband and the opportunities that he had for real accountability, for healing through therapy and rehabilitation. I've come to believe that we can't set people up for success after prison unless everyone gets access to those opportunities. We need to build a justice system that we can believe in, that we can trust. So when someone comes out, we know that they've paid their debt to society and they're ready to contribute. I've shared with you three solutions for improving transitions from prison to employment, using new technologies to scale access to reentry support and education, cutting the red tape by providing IDs and enrolling people in programs prior to release, and breaking down the stigma by getting underneath the stereotypes and the labels to get to know the person. Instead of blaming the individual for the failures of a system, we need to focus more on closing the opportunity gap. It's going to take a collective movement to dismantle the structural racism in our institutions, in our labor markets, and in our society. And it's going to take a collective effort to break the cycles of violence in our relationships, our families, and our communities. We can make a different choice to reinvent our justice system, but it's going to come down to us, all of us. Thank you. Nobody deserves to be remembered for only the worst thing they've ever done. I was adopted into a home in typical suburbia, north of Denver. My home, like millions of others, was filled with dysfunction, physical abuse, and substance abuse. At an early age, I started reading and showed a talent for music, singing, playing piano, flute, and stringed instruments. In the chaos that became my home life, that music and those compliments from my school 
provided a refuge that I didn't have at home. When I was couch surfing in high school, that was the one place that I could count on was music. Sadly, as I left high school, I left that creativity behind. It comes as no surprise that I married a man who was violent and had his own substance abuse demons. That cycle of violence continues every day. So because I was adopted, I felt abandonment issues and unworthy, that I had to buy love, affection, acceptance. And so that's what I did. I had friends that were my friends as long as I was footing the bill that opened up their home to me as long as I paid for it. And so when things got continually worse in my home, I did what anybody else does. You find a way to cope. So working as a bookkeeper, I began stealing money. I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. I knew it was wrong, but I felt like I had to. I had to keep up the appearance that everything was OK and I was normal. And so as my husband continued to not want to go to work and sank deeper into his own addiction issues, I began stealing more and more money. Small amounts became larger amounts. And I'm not proud to say that over a decade, I stole half a million dollars from employers. Time moved on. and. I stole money to divorce that man, stole money to move into an apartment, and stole yet more money as I found another man who thought it was great that I would throw money his way to buy his love. So time rolled on, and one night, police officers showed up at my door. I was shocked and embarrassed because one of them had been at my home recently when he removed my ex from my apartment. I had been the victim in a domestic violence case, and now I was the criminal they were arresting. I was 38 years old, and I had never spent a night in jail. I had no idea what to expect. The police officers were kinder than I expected them to be. It was a cold February night, and they let me get a coat, told me what I could and could not take, and even let me call a client who was an attorney before they took me to jail. If I hadn't been white, would they have done that? Probably not. So I get to jail. Remember, I've never been there before. And I'll, I spent one night in jail and used yet still more stolen money to bail out. And over about a year of pretrial and going to court and all of that, I was then sentenced to the Department of Corrections. Remember, I've only ever spent one night in jail. I had no idea what to expect. And for anyone, prison is traumatizing and overwhelming. It takes, for me, I think the first year is the roughest. And so after that first year, when I felt I had sort of settled into a routine, I pursued what I knew was coming, another case in another county from an employer I had stolen money from. I wanted to get all of my prison time out in one shot. So to my utter shock, I was sentenced to a community corrections case. That's typically a diversion case. And all of a sudden, I had a 20-year sentence. So I went back to prison and, on paper, looked like I would be a good fit for community corrections, which in your state might be something like work release. Two and a half years later, I was released to community corrections. But remember that diversion sentence? Well, that meant that essentially I had two separate sentences to serve. One with the Department of Corrections, where I was still considered an inmate, and the other a diversion community correction sentence. So that means two sets of office visits, two sets of restitution payments, two sets of urinalysis testing. And the rules of the two different entities didn't always agree. For example, my parole officer wanted to save me time on the bus, and so she said I could drive a car. The halfway house said, no, you can't do that. Well, I can't do both of those things, right? So over time, the county where I was staying in a community corrections house revoked the contract of the house I was in. Well, that meant I had to go to another city to report in. 
and was still serving two sentences. I was working at a company as an office manager. Should I have been working in an office? Absolutely not, because I was a bookkeeper who had stolen money. And when my parole officer said, I'm not so sure I want you working there, my community corrections case manager said, well, if you quit your job, we're going to write you up and send you back to prison. Again, can't do both of those things. So like anyone else who is struggling and doesn't know what they're going to do next, what do you do? You go back to what you know. For some people, that might be selling drugs or gang life. Well, for me, it's forging payroll checks. And so when I struggled, I couldn't pay my rent or had a car that maybe I shouldn't have been driving because halfway house said I couldn't, what did I do? I started stealing money because I had desperately asked for help when I couldn't pay my rent. One place told me, well, you're not a parent, so we can't help you. Another place told me, well, you're not a recovering addict, so you don't fit our criteria. A third place said, well, we can't help you until you have an eviction notice. But then when I got that eviction notice, they didn't have any funding. So yeah, I started stealing more money. And I was already under supervision. So I went to my parole officer and I turned myself in, knowing that I was going back to prison. But in a way, as strange as it sounds, it was a relief because the constant confusion of those two sentences wasn't going to exist anymore. So I went back to prison, where I had just left 18 months before, the same facility. I had to walk back onto that yard, and it was humiliating. Because remember, on paper, I looked like I would be successful. I was educated, I'm articulate, looked like it would be great, but I couldn't find a job, so I couldn't pay my rent. At some point, I was going to end up back in prison. But the benefit for me was I really recognized that something was not right within me. I needed to fix what was wrong. And so in that incarceration, I really focused on cognitive improvement. I took every character development class I could. I enrolled in cosmetology so that I would have a career that was felon friendly when I left prison. And four years later, when it was my turn to return to community corrections, I felt more prepared. I knew I was going to struggle because life throws things our way, but I felt better prepared. And the other thing that made a difference for me is that when I left prison, I connected with the organizations that had helped me while I was inside. The DU Prison Arts Initiative had helped me to learn how to write about my feelings, learn some mindfulness. They offered me a job. The Realness Project, where I had learned authentic relating techniques, offered me a job. And Breakthrough, which was an organization where I had learned character development and job readiness skills, offered me a job. And those three organizations believed in me. And not only did they provide me reentry support, but they also provided me friendship. And I didn't have to do a thing for it, except show up and be there. So for me, I believe that programming and reentry services are crucial to our people that are coming home. The vast majority of people who are currently incarcerated will come home at some point. What sort of people, employees, neighbors, do you want them to be? We have to provide them the base and the knowledge that they are OK just as they are, and we don't judge them for the worst decisions that they've ever made. Thank you. This piece is entitled, Why I Scream. Maya Angelou so beautifully and poetically wrote down why the cage bird sings. But I'm gonna pick up the pieces that she left behind and explain why this cage bird scream. You see, I scream because it took only one bad and ill-advised decision to be deemed as a menace to society by public officials. I screamed because no one wanted to listen to this hurt and broken child that was begging and pleading for attention, but all of a sudden, after one bad and ill-advised decision, I got my whole community's attention. 
I screamed because society's answer to the problem was a cage, a lock and a key. I screamed because I started to believe all of the hurtful things that the district attorney was saying about me, things like I was a super predator and that I should never be set free. Fast forward just one year later and I turned 18 and my screams became 10 times louder because my name had been replaced with a number. 10, 46, 186 were the seven digits that got wrapped around my wrist and at that moment in my life, Nothing at all made any sense. So I crunched the numbers like a mathematician trying to somehow make sense out of this huge, humongous sentence. But no matter how I added it, subtracted it, multiplied it, or divided it, I was still left serving a 25 to life sentence for one bad, ill-advised, and tragic decision. Little did I realize how much that one decision would impact all of my future decisions and push me like a man on a mission to stand in a position to declare to the world that I am more than just my worst decision. We are more than just our worst decision. Until that truth finally resonate within us, we can never break free from our past. Listen, if we want to be free and spread our wings and soar, then you have to be willing to let go. Let go of past hurt and shame, guilt and pain, and trust that who you are is enough. Listen, I had to let go of who I was to make room for who I was becoming. And honestly, it was one of the best decisions I've ever made because I've been home for a while now and my feet has not hit the ground once because I continue to soar. Since my release in 2017, I've been able to earn my bachelor's degree, my master's degree, and this fall, I will be starting my PhD program to earn my doctorate as a marriage and family therapist. I am an educator, an activist, a counselor, a facilitator, a father, a husband, and as you all see, also a poet. But along with all of that, I'm also K81900, a formerly incarcerated individual living with the label felon and having to navigate the 47,000 collateral consequences that come with that label. Collateral consequences that affect everything from housing and employment to mental health and physical well being. But what if? What if we, as a community in broader society, work together to dismantle and remove the barriers that hold so many formerly incarcerated individuals down? What if we did that? If we did, I'm willing to guarantee that there would be more formerly incarcerated individuals that would soar. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for just listening there, and um, I'm really honored to, to have Marcus Bullock here from Fix Shop, as well as Connor Powelson, who uh, unfortunately Dr. Ray couldn't be here today because his son is in a track meet, <laughs> and um, it's a beautiful day, so I, I hope he's doing well, but, but his, he, his lead research assistant will actually be doing a demo for us as, after we get started. So um, bef before we really get into the demo, I wanted to just ask Marcus if he could introduce himself and just share some of his reactions and connections to what he just saw. Oh, wow. What's up, you guys? How's everybody doing this evening? This was so dope to watch. I'm so glad I got a chance to experience this with sitting right next to you. That was such an incredible experience. Um, listening to the speakers was amazing for me one being on that stage and remembering like the nervous jitters that I had when I walked on the stage but then also being vulnerable enough to be able to share the stories like Xavier did and um yeah I gotta I gotta text Xavier at night and be like yo bro yo you killed that was amazing 
um, being able to also, one, share the stage with you. That was an incredible picture. I don't know, but that was an awesome picture. But, but what, listen, what, watching you describe the data and how it informs the research that you do and the work that we do together to collaborate, um, here, listening to um, other women's experience um, going through incarceration, I think that's an interesting one because uh, that's one of the populations that we don't get a chance to hear about often. When we think about incarceration, we mostly hear about men going to prison and um, women are one of the fastest growing populations that are going into these cells and um, I love hearing her, her, you know, her perspective on how that, what that experience was like for her. And then the poetry at the end, it's always dope when people end with the arts. So this was all incredible. I know you didn't ask me to give a recap of the whole talk, but um, I'm living it out loud and I had to think through what I had to, to, to wrestle with while going through the emotional sides of remembering incarceration, um, grappling with the data that helps inform a lot of these decisions. Um, I'm grateful to have experienced this tonight. Thank you for sharing um, your story and your journey with us as well, Annalise. Thank you. Do you want to say a little bit about Flick Shop? And- oh, my bad. That was a whole thing I talked about my feedback <laughs> and didn't even get a chance to talk about. Yeah, like, who, are he, who am I? Okay, so I'm Marcus Bullock. I'm the CEO and founder of Flick Shop. Uh, we built the technologies that help keep families connected to their incarcerated loved ones. Uh, we wanted to figure out ways to be able to combine data science, family engagement, um, and employment opportunities to be able to uh, reduce recidivism. And so we're excited about building the technologies that, that, that make that happen, help make that happen. Um, we're excited about the collaboration that we're working with alongside Connor. I'm excited to hear you share about the amazing work that we're doing. I might be a little bit biased, but it's so incredible. Um, <laughs> But we want to be able to learn how to, we want to learn how to uh, bring immersive learning environments into the sales that, um, some of the sales I used to live in many years ago. And I'm more than happy to talk about that work, but I won't dominate the stage today. Thank you, Marcus. So, uh, Connor, do you want to introduce yourself and then maybe just go ahead and go into the demo? Sure, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so my name is Connor Pallison. Uh, I'm, at, I'm in the uh, University of Maryland's Lab for Applied Social Science Research. I'm a PhD candidate uh, in the Department of Sociology. Dr. Rayshawn Ray, um, who I'm filling in for today, is my advisor, uh, as well as the, um, the leader of the, the Lab for Applied Social Science Research. So um, I'm going to show you some of the work that we've been doing for the last five or six years uh, in the virtual reality space. Our work has been centered around evaluating and training officers using virtual reality technology. And uh, we partnered with Jigsaw to further, Jigsaw is a subsidiary or a, a part of, of Google, they're the nonprofit wing of Google. And we've partnered with Jigsaw to expand our virtual reality technology uh, to include natural language processing in a computer generated environment so that people using this technology can interact with simulated characters and that we can evaluate and train individuals uh, using the virtual environment. Um, our goal here is to expand the police training that we have to reach out to other populations and train in other contexts. Uh, so partnering with Flickshop and um, Marshawn, uh, we're going to hopefully use this in, in prisons and be able to really reach this population, which um, is largely underserved. So I'm going to share uh, some of the stuff we have now. So as I was saying, so the Lab for Applied Social Science Research has been doing this for five or six years. We started with an uh, initial, more rudimentary uh, virtual reality program, uh, where essentially we went out to locations that police officers um, that we had worked with um, were familiar with, and we went out and recorded scenes um, of interactions with civilians. And these video recordings are useful because they're, they're putting officers in real-life situations and interacting with uh, realistic individuals. However, there's a limitation in that uh, these are recordings and that you're not able to actually um, have an interaction. You're not able to have a back and forth with the simulated individuals. So um, through partnering with Google, through partnering with Jigsaw, uh, we were able to expand, as I said, to the CGI environment where there's natural language processing and a discourse can be, can be had. Uh, we use this program uh, with departments across the nation, uh, mostly on the east, uh, south, and mid-Atlantic. Um, and we use this to evaluate how officers are talking to people in situations. Uh, these are experimental situations uh, in which we vary the race of the character uh, that the officer is speaking to. We vary the situation that they're in. Is it a uh, mental health wellness check? Is it a uh, traffic stop? Is it a suspicious person call? 
And we vary the person that the individual is speaking with, the officer is speaking with, the situation that they're in, and we're seeing how are their biases informing what they're saying, um, how, how are their um, behaviors changing, so are they making arrests differentially, are they, um, are they using differential force, for instance, drawing uh, simulated firearms, um, and we evaluate their, their behaviors uh, primarily through their speech. So what are they saying? How are they saying it? Uh, we can use voice recordings to evaluate, uh, for instance, stress that the officer is using. So are they speaking kindly or more, uh, less respectfully, more or less respectfully? So um, I'm going to show you one of the scenarios that we have. Uh, and unfortunately, I can't show you a situation that had an officer involved um, for confidentiality. But uh, here's one that, that I recorded of, of me going through it. And what you're going to see is the first person of what it looks like to be in these virtual reality situations. Um, in this scenario, I'm going to show you a store robbery. Uh, so the officer is interacting with a, a clerk who was robbed um, about 40 minutes in the past. So this is after the robbery occurred, and the officer arrived on the scene late. I'm just going to show a portion of this video. Officer, there we go. There is an officer. Okay, let me skip forward. Well, look who it is. It's about time. I called you over an hour ago. Seriously, what does it take for you to come into this part of Honestly, I can't believe the kind of treatment that we've been getting on this block after these robberies continue to terrorize the neighborhood. My name is Officer Pallison. What's your name? I'm Brian Miller. I'm the one who called this in. That was an hour ago. You know that? I understand. Are the suspects here now? Which way did they go? I don't know where they went. You guys have to do something before someone gets seriously hurt. Okay, what did the people look like? They just look like the usual bangers that are constantly terrorizing this neighborhood. Okay, what were they wearing? What was their race? They were the same punks as before. This time they were wearing black t-shirts and jeans. Okay, what was their race? It was a black guy and a Latina girl. The same two punks as the last robbery. Thank you, what did they take? Drop the register and mess the place up. You didn't give a shit last time, so they came back. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Um, so this gives you a sense of what's going on in these situations. Um, the officer is able to ask questions and get feedback based on what they said. Uh, one thing that's not so apparent here is that the, uh, the natural language processing actually takes into account the, um, the affect or the, the vocal affect, the, um, the respectfulness of the language. So um, if the officer uses a more friendly, kind, uh, not only words, but tone, uh, the program is more likely to provide information, uh, whereas if the officer uses a more disrespectful language, a more aggressive tone, the character is less likely to provide information. And so uh, what we do is we take um, what is the officer saying, what kind of questions are they asking, how are they asking those questions, and we uh, can generate a score of um, how respectful is this officer or how disrespectful is this officer based on all the feedback that they're getting in the situation. Anyway, we take all this information to look at um, how are officers changing their behavior based on the situation that they go into. Uh, we look at their training past, uh, and we say, hey, you know, these characteristics are, pro are producing officers that are, used, that are more respectful in these situations. These other characteristics are producing officers that are less disrespectful in these situations. How do we produce officers, or how do we replicate those better characteristics in officers? Um, this is going to be a training tool for, for departments. So the departments are um, beginning to use this um, not with researchers, but with their own officers to uh, improve their training. But so our goal here is to, is to take this uh, platform. Uh, we have access to the repository. For instance, we can change anything. We change the setting. We change the characters. We can change what they're saying. And we want to create situations now that are, are usable in, in, in prison settings to help incarcerated individuals um, gain the skills that they need to return to society uh, effectively. So um, one part of doing that is creating scenarios that are useful for that population. Um, and we have a, essentially a concept uh, that we aim to produce, not, not just this, um, this video setting, but a CGI setting using the platform that we already have. Um, so 
This is a, um, an interview here, and I'm no actor, but I'm the actor here. Um, so this is the type of settings that we want to make. We want to make a scene where an individual will go into an interview setting, they can look 360 degrees around, and they can practice um, answering questions in an interview. Uh, they can go through, you know, if an interviewer asks me this, what am I going to say? And they can actually go through it and do it. Uh, they can prepare for the types of questions that they're going to be exposed to. Uh, and they can actually embody the interaction. They can gain skills that they need to, to go through that interaction. So I'll just give you a taste of what this looks like uh, and kind of what the script looks like. Go through. This is for a, a warehouse job. Properly, uh, settling employment disputes, uh, these kind of things. Um, now, what we're going to do here is I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Just answer them. Uh, no more than a couple minutes each question, and uh, there's still only about ten questions here. We'll go through. Uh, after that, we'll we'll uh, we'll follow up in a couple weeks and let you know if you got the position. But uh, first, can you walk me through your employment history? Uh, tell me some jobs you've had in the past, uh, how well you had them, uh, how long you held them, uh, how you enjoyed them, those kind of things. Those. Okay, that gives you an idea of of the types of scenes we're creating here, and so. Um, while this is just a video, the idea is that with the natural language processing that our, um, that our Jigsaw virtual reality tool has is um, an, a, an individual will not only be able to speak, speak to a video, uh, but will actually be able to have a conversation in an interview setting, be able to practice uh, not just responding to questions simply, but actually, um, you know, what does a conversation look like in this setting? Um, so some of the things that we can do with this is not only having them practice, but we can um, give them feedback on these, on these um, situations. So the um, virtual reality technology creates a transcription of what they had said um, and some information about how they said it, for instance, their tone. Uh, we can give feedback, hey, um, you seemed a little uncertain here when you answered this question, or you seemed more confident here when you, when you answered this question. Maybe you need to do more work on this part of your interview response. Um, some other great features about the virtual reality is not only that uh, we're able to record audio and, and the discourse, um, but there's also a capability to have drop-down menus, um, to have um, text input, to have, um, for instance, survey responses. So um, we can have, uh, in, these, in these virtual reality headsets, we can have tests, quizzes, and we can have, um, uh, which we provide feedback on, but we also have, um, for instance, surveys that can be used by researchers uh, looking at the characteristics of the people that come into these situations and how it's affecting them as they go through, um, as they go on to the external life back into society. And we can evaluate how these situations are changing their behaviors and uh, what are the characteristics and what are the training methods that reduce recidivism to the highest extent. Um, now, when we worked with officers, um, we used the really intensive virtual reality um, headset. But going into um, prisons, we're looking for a little bit different, a little bit different technology. So um, we, we plan to use the Oculus Go. Uh, it's a really fantastic a piece of equipment because it's really cheap. It's only $200 per unit. It's lightweight plastic, uh, one and a half hour to two and a half hour battery life, uh, just enough for a, a long classroom session. Uh, it also provides a platform where we can have locked online or offline use um, so that people who are using it can only use the softwares um, that are designed to be used, um, that are locked on the, on the program. Uh, so this could be educational material. This can be um, survey material. This can be testing material. Um, anything that is put on there can only be accessed uh, with the headset. Um, and, of course, there's the first person recording, uh, video recording, audio recording. Here. So it's just this. This is what we'd like to have individuals be able to use in their cells, and it connects them with not only all the educational material, um, but partnering with FlickShop, all the FlickShop content. So not only connecting them with educational material, but with material that can connect them with their families, with their friends. Um, and that's all I'll say for now. I'm, I've took them way too much time already. <laughs> Thank you, Connor. <laughs> So, yeah, so Rishon and I have been working on a concept of, like I said in my talk, taking programs like Prison to Employment Connection or FlickShop School of Business and bringing that into this more interactive virtual reality environment. 
And so the idea is we might start with the landscape study, find out what some of the programs are, do some interviews with people both before release and after to, to really figure out what kinds of obstacles are they concerned about or what types of um, support would be helpful, um, and then really testing it in a few regions. Um, and so um, Marcus, after starting FlickShop, then created a business school around how to start your own business. Because since so many people do experience so much discrimination in the regular hiring market, starting a business is often um, a route that people can do um, you know, to, to really make their way and, and earn a living. So do you want to talk a little bit about the School of Business and how you've been working with Rayshawn's team to bring it into VR? Absolutely. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for walking us through. Um, you so undersold it. I wish I, I really want to go through it. Matter of fact, I, let's give it a little bit. Of, I'm going to give a little bit of context to FlickShop, why we created what we did and what we're working on at FlickShop School of Business. Um, so the way that our technology at FlickShop works, it allows our users the ability to uh, take a picture, add some quick text, press send, and for 99 cents, we print that text we print that picture and text on a real tangible postcard, and we ship it to any person in any sale anywhere in the country. We wanted to figure out a way to begin to democratize communications inside of these facilities, because as you guys, I'm sure so many of you guys know, um, you know the prison phone rates and some of the, uh, the, the other companies that work inside of these, these spaces, um, they begin to become predatory as they dominate the, the market. Um, and, and while we were thoughtful about wanting to build a technology that one could cross between the state and federal facilities and the county jails and the juvenile facilities and even now the ICE detention centers, um, we wanted to also figure out a way to leverage all of the big data that we were beginning to collect from the tens of thousands of people who receive one of our notifications notifications in the mail. Uh, so far, we've connected over uh, 170,000 families around the country, um, and we've shipped over 700,000 postcards into all 50 states. Uh, and we were thoughtful about, one, wh how could we leverage this data responsibly? Uh, because we also have heard of some of the folks who will take some of the big data and potentially use it maliciously to begin to either market cross-market product or begin to prey on families in more innovative ways or um, even now how they're thinking about leveraging some of this information to expand legislation to help continue to keep people in for these longer sentences. And so we wanted to be able to make sure that one, we were building the gateway to prevent that from happening. But we, what we also wanted to do was wanted to take the learnings that I gained over the journey of launching a tech company um, and, and, and me being passionate about this only because I went to prison when I was a 15-year-old kid for carjacking somebody in Fairfax County, um, Virginia at Springfield Mall. That was a horrible decision that me and my 16-year-old friend did during our sophomore and junior years of high school, and it landed us in prison for eight years growing up as a teenager in, in, my, as in early 20s inside of some of the state of Virginia's worst prison facilities. The only reason I was able to navigate through that journey was because my mom made a promise to me in a prison visiting room to not allow for me to go down this path and adopt the prison culture that would get me to believe as a 16, 17 year old kid that I was going to die there with my friends who also had terms like life plus 43 years in these cells. Growing up in prison in, as a kid was very, very interesting because it also robbed me of the experience of the sponge that I had that wanted more and more information. I was so thirsty for knowledge, and I wanted to also figure out how I was going to figure out how to navigate this new reentry process, getting arrested at 15 and then going home at 23, missing almost a decade and not even being able to explain where I've been for almost the last decade of my life. That was an interesting journey, and I want to figure out how can I take the experiences that I had of applying for jobs and learning how to navigate these muddy waters. I haven't even spoken to somebody like with a serious conversation of the opposite sex for almost the ten, last 10 years, right? Like, I had no idea how to be an adult in a world that had bustling new technologies that weren't even available when I got it. I got locked up with a beeper on my waist, yeah. <laughs> right? Like, I came home, there was Google, 
You know what I mean? Like the whole world changed. How are we giving space for the men and women that are living in these cells to be able to begin to prepare for success after prison? Now, there are very thoughtful programs that are existing around the country, but we knew we wanted to probably skip a leap and be more thoughtful and innovative about how we wanted to be able to bring that same kind of programming into these facilities. We were able to get a grant through the Aspen Institute to begin to launch Flick Shop School of Business, where we introduce soft skills development and introducing tech and entrepreneurship to our, uh, our, our, we call all of our resident scholars. All of us, because they got to know how brilliant they are the first day of school, right? But when they come in, now they're learning how to generate revenue, and they go from talking about how they used to sell, like I used to, I talk about how I learned how to sell crack and how I used to bag all my bags, my crack and like my blue bags. But I learned how to describe that as me identifying what product market fit was in my neighborhood, right? <laughs> Over time, it's interesting because it's interesting when you got dudes on a rec yard using words like product market fit. The warden is like, I don't know what you did in there, but somehow they identify with this interesting story that you told them, Marcus. How we bring these, these kinds of environments that we're all used to living in out here back into those facilities was going to be challenging. And so we partner with the University of Maryland and with Rish, Dr. Rish, um, Rashawn Ray and, and Connor and their team to begin to figure out how to bring these 360 360-degree cameras inside of some of our classrooms where we begin to tell, show, tell, show our scholars how we did it. What was my story from prison entrepreneurship? Now, that 360-degree camera can place that same content in some of these cameras that still recognize some of these goggles that recognize the eye movements and can see where someone's paying attention when they're going through a job interview or when they're sitting in the seat of an 18-wheeler truck and learning how to use an air brake system with goggles on their head while they're sitting in a prison cell. You see, this is how we leverage tech and innovation to reduce recidivism. If we're being very thoughtful and responsible about the innovations that we are creating, then we can, one, democratize communications, which also creates a safe haven for families to have connectivity with one another. But we also can employ, work with some of our like, employment partners in colleges and universities and now some of the largest think tanks in the country to be able to begin to bring a different kind of educational experience um, preparing some of those 600,000 people that are coming home every year um, for a real work environment. Thank you, Marcus. And I will say uh, there are, I think, 17 talks from TEDx, and one of them is about this issue of like identifying a skill that you were using, you know, previously when you were, you know, living a life of crime and then re reinventing that into something that is marketable and it's called Concreates. So the founders of Concreates have a whole talk on that and I think it's really inspiring. But anyway, so I think those talks will be on YouTube or TED platform within the next month um, if you want to find them. Um, but anyway, so I wanted to throw that in because I think that's really critical. Um, um, yeah, so one of the questions we got in the audience that I wanted to pose um, and talk about is how can you support peer-to-peer -peer connection through some of this technology? And um, I had one idea that I'll, I'll put out there, um, but I wanted to see if you all had other ideas. One was, so we talked a lot about using the tech in the uh, facility, but you can also use it after someone's released. And one of the things that I come across in workforce development a lot is that um, even even for people outside, like you, you might want to take a class in, let's say, cybersecurity or, you know, robotics, but your local community college doesn't offer it. Um, so what I think you could do for this is connect people interested in a certain learning pathway that may not be available locally um, and connect it with folks who are teaching it who have a record or who reflect the population that you're connecting and you could actually, you know, essentially create a cohort and you could connect it to the internet and have a class. Like you sit in a virtual classroom, Marcus teaches the class and you're all sort of learning a topic and you're able to kind of chat with each other and build relationships through that software. Um, and I think that's to me one use case that would example exemplify ways of connecting with people uh, through the technology as well as sort of just sort of being this out there virtual world. Um, but anyway, I thought maybe you two had other ideas about that. Yeah, um, so definitely, definitely connecting people is, is one aspect. So videos, uh, 
audio recordings, these are things that are not currently available to those incarcerated. Uh, being able to hear a loved one's voice um, in, in a virtual setting, uh, particularly, I mean, imagine sitting there at the family, at the family Christmas tree, <laughs> um, sitting there um, at a birthday party. Um, that, that level of connection is not uh, currently available. Um, so being able to live those experiences is um, surely emotionally touching. Um, one, one aspect of the, of the training that I'm excited of is that um, not only can you, you know, witness, uh, not only can you go through these situations yourself, but you can actually witness yourself going through these situations. Um, because the audio is recording, because the gaze is recorded where your head is looking, uh, you could actually look at yourself uh, as you go through the situation from a third-party perspective and say, hey, this is me sitting here and talking to this interviewer. I'm looking at myself. I'm, I'm evaluating myself. Did I do well? Did I not do well? But also seeing yourself in that context and saying, hey, I'm going to be there one day. Um, I can do this. Um, that I'm not just going to be sitting here for the rest of my life, that it, you know, in the not-too-distant future, I'll be sitting in this chair and I'm going to be this person. And I think that, um, that connection to the outside world is, is immeasurable. Yeah, I agree. And, and, and just so that, you know, we move on. But, but with brevity, I'm doubling down on this one. I think that there's, you know, it's an interesting thing around proximity. I'm so glad that there's been conversations around people having proximity um, on the screen. But there's something about having proximity. One, it begins to eradicate those moments of imposter syndrome when you don't believe that you can even do it. There is so many people that have been telling me from the time that I went through the first receiving center at 15 years old that I would be back before I before I even realized that I was actually going to have to do the eight years, there was someone telling me that before I came home, I was going to be back. And I've been doing that. I, I had to go through that the entire time I was in prison. And not just from the correctional officers, even the people who I lived in the rec yard with. The dudes who I lived in the rec yard, they were like, oh, so you going to go home and start your little business? <laughs> your little business thing, right? We want to see how that works out for you, Marcus, right? And, 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 and it's interesting how we think about building these immersive environments and how we bring proximity into these spaces that otherwise wouldn't have the, the hope in the aspirational language that will allow for me to feel like I can win. And so when we think about how we're building, again, some of this, this, this tech, I love the conversations that we're having about proximity to, to, to the future. And then the other thing, you know, as we think about like what we all can do, you know, I heard you kind of sort of allude to that, what we all can do to participate in this. One, if I'm being completely honest, like what's the big thing that's going to happen is you taking this conversation home with you tonight and really changing the dinner table conversation. Mention some of the folks that were on the screens and share the TED Talks with some of your peers who probably otherwise wouldn't have that same proximity to an Xavier. Because I think what will end up happening is, one, we're going to change the dinner table conversations, which is really what changes legislation, which was where we rolled down policy. But also, it gives those in our community the feeling of the feelings of empathy that will allow for them to connect with some of those same 600,000 people that are going to be coming home back to yours in my neighborhood, right? Now we have empathy combined with proximity, and I think that we're, we're on to something, uh, something major there. Yeah, actually. So sorry for that tangent, oh, no. but I had to piggyback on Good, my Matt Connaughton. Actually, Makeda Henry Nicky, who's another fellow here at Brookings, she and I talked a lot about using the VR with employers. So having... Uh, it, at Checker, they have this training program they put everyone through that comes to, the, to work there. Everybody that works there has to go through a simulated, in-person and simulated experience where they're given a scenario and they have to make their way as if uh, they are someone navigating the world with a criminal record. So um, I was like, well, let's put that in the VR and have that, you know, train everyone at Brookings, you know, on like what is that experience like and what, how do you connect empathy, bring empathy into that um, through VR actually on the employer side. Um, but anyway, I wanted to see if anyone in the audience had a question that they'd like to share with the panel. Amanda. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Thanks for your talk, and the video is amazing. Um, so I'm from the National Governors Association, so I'm thinking about taking what you're sharing about individual experiences up to kind of the policy level. And I think we have a unique moment here with the Digital Equity Act passed as part of the infrastructure bill, which has a priority population of incarcerated individuals. So if you had advice to give to states who are thinking about how to spend those dollars, how to partner to 
to really create impact um, with all that money that's going to be flowing into states. Um, and combining that with like sk digital skill development, all that kind of stuff. Um, what advice would you give about where they should start, uh, where they should focus, and what voices should be at their planning tables? Probably me. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so I've been trying to tell states, because it's not just that, it's all the infrastructure money, all the ARPA money. They're getting a lot of money. And I was like, how do you get them to not just throw it at a project, like a one-off thing, but actually think creatively? And one of the key contexts right now is that we have a really tight labor market. Employers cannot find people, you know, right now. And I'm like, who's going to show up when you put that job posting out? You have all these jobs to hire, and nobody's going to come. So I was like, you have to be creative about bringing your Department of Corrections to the table when you're having these infrastructure conversations about jobs and issues like that. We have digital equity money we need to spend, right? So I think part of it is, is thinking about inside and how do we make sure that state laws and rules allow for technologies like VR to be inside, even if it's not connected to the Internet. Sometimes it can be like a years-long process just to get permission to take it inside. So that's one. Get, get rid of some of those rules um, and make sure that it's allowed in every facility. And secondly, um, make sure that like when you're working with employers, hiring people that have different backgrounds that are different from the people that used to work on those jobs, you have to train your managers. You have to train your supervisors. So I think part of it is creating some curricula and technical assistance uh, that can really go out through like extension programs and really training people on how to work in diverse teams and how to create a welcoming environment um, and what is and isn't acceptable uh, in terms of um, you know, bringing people into your organization that are different from everyone else. And that's a lot of work that I see that employers have to do. Um, it's not changing the person coming in. It's changing how we as a company are um, receiving people and making sure they feel welcome. Um, and so I think... Those are all things that, you know, when you're doing a marketing campaign to hire, you have to really understand your audience. And so I think there's a lot of room there. Um, but those are, those are great questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Hey, how are you? Sorry. Um, this is a great, everything you guys are doing are great as far as um, making this, it's weird, I can hear myself. Um, <laughs> The, the, um, there's a couple of questions I wanted to ask, but in particular what comes up is, you mentioned data, data, whatever you want to say. Uh, Marcus mentioned trying to, just being transparent from the beginning as far as what's going to happen to this data or data, I think would build a lot of trust in the community. How, how, do you, like, how did you decide that was important, and how do you continue to work with organizations because the money's probably going to come for this. This is some important information. And so kind of setting that model for other people to come after you to kind of follow you. What, what, how do you do that and how are you doing that? Yeah, that's a great question. This is why you should get the state folks to give people who are formerly incarcerated the bread to be able to build the technologies and to be in the rooms to actually help deliver some of the solutions that we can do it responsibly. So that's my answer to that last question. Yeah. Um, we need way more people like me in the table to have those kinds of conversations. And if nothing else to be able to just give a diverse uh, way of thinking about how we've Thought, how we've been thinking about doing it in the past, right? I'm not here to deliver all of the solutions because I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm throwing a bunch of noodles at the wall and seeing which one of them stick. Now, going about, you know, asking that question in that same vein of throwing noodles at the wall, you know, it's been interesting as we continue to build FlickShop. I mean, now we're one of the most impactful apps inside of the App Store, and there are folks who um, want to leverage our data in, in interesting ways. I mean, from our some of our larger clients like Boeing, Delta Airlines, Bank of America, Meta, Slack. There are some interesting customers of ours, and we're being and we enjoy having those those customers. But I think that the the reason why I'm able to um, have so much introspection inside of some of those same conversations is because my I got an MA number two four seven three eight four, 
And that's the predominant reason why I, one, lead with that way of thinking about delivering data responsibly and, how we, and why we protect it is because the reality of it is, is that, man, I didn't get jobs when I came home because I had to check a box that said, have you been convicted of a felony? And when it was before a ban of box. It was only as a result of one application saying, have you been convicted of a felony, comma, within the last seven years. I did an eight-year prison sentence, so I was able to say, no, I haven't been convicted of a felony within the last seven years. But, but, but can you imagine the same, like, the same places where I apply to the, the giant foods, the foot lockers, the UPSs, all those places that told me no, I would have been your top sale. Can you, foot locker told me no. I would have crushed that foot locker. I love sneakers. If you can't tell, I would have sold a lot of joints. At any rate, I, dig- I digress. The, the, the reason why I think it's important is because when you lead with that, that, that background, that lived experience, it forces me to be thoughtful about how we're protecting some of those others who may not be bold enough to be able to sit on some of the front of a stage and say, hey, I committed a carjacking when I was a kid. Some of folks don't want to live with that, right? That, was a, that felony lives forever. And some of us are, are relegated to the shadows. Now, I want to be able to pull most of us out of it by being the one that takes the, da- the daggers in my back and be like, yo, look, I did it. And let me show you how dope I am, how brilliant I am. And I don't have the cold, I don't have the cold switch, right? Y'all see, I don't cold switch. But I'm super dope and I'm brilliant. And I want to figure out ways to be able to bring so many people from that behind me. And I can't do it if I'm sharing all of this information that may um, be the precursor for another no or slam door for the, those men and women. Uh, what's going on? My name's Peter Rez. I'm from Jersey City. Thank you, all three of y'all, oh, everybody in the room that works on criminal justice reform. Um, great conversation. Um, I have learned in my life, hurt people hurt people. I'm sure many people who've been to prison know that. Um, I feel like us as a society, we are accepting more and more day by day that nonviolent criminals are okay to come back home. People who sold marijuana with marijuana being legalized, other nonviolent crimes, people are okay with them coming back. But I'm of the mind, and I'm trying to convince more and more people that even violent criminals should come home and should have opportunities for rehabilitation. And people are, I feel like a lot of people are like, okay, they can come home, but they can't work at my job. They can have another job, but they can't have my job. Um, Or they can't work at my company or organization. And so I'm wondering, I really like what you said, Marcus, about uh, the dinner table conversations really elevating to policy debates later on. And so I'm wondering, um, how do we shift that conversation and that stigma around violent criminals um, coming home, I don't know if y'all agree with that, but um, around even people who've committed violent felonies, um, whether they were children or adults, and um, giving them the opportunity to do stuff like virtual reality and having the opportunity to come back and um, get those jobs. So, thank you. Man, okay, I feel like I'm dominating this conversation, so I'm so, so sorry to you, Connor. And, Love and to hear from you. <laughs> yeah, my bad, my bad, but, but Peter, this is a good one, and I'm going to make this one really, really short. Like, first, you could just tell him, like, I met Marcus, because I, I had a violent crime. Let's be very, I had a carjacking, you know what I mean? Like, I made a horrible decision to pull a gun out of the man, tap on his window with a gun, tell him to get out of his car. We jumped in the driver's and the passenger side seat of the car, sped off out of the parking lot, left him standing right there and was flying down 95 before we found ourselves in handcuffs the very next day. And yet and still, I still deserve a second chance. Full stop. And I think that once we begin to leverage these kinds of use cases, and this is why I use storytelling in order to be able to do this, I think that then we can begin to balance those conversations. And that's how you introduce it. Like, yo, I met Marcus. Yeah, and I will say that, you know, I shared my friend's story, but I actually have another friend who had a domestic violence situation. And I personally have been the victim of harassment and stalking. And as a woman, you know, walking through our society, I'm very well aware of our violence problems. And so... To me, that's why this is so important because we aren't focusing on healing traumas at any point. And things like CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, have been shown in evidence to be very effective in rehabilitation settings. And yet, does everyone get that? No. (laughs) And so, excuse me. So to me, like this is what drives my work is that we what we're doing isn't solving 
this cycle of violence. Um, and I don't see how we can move beyond that unless we do think about, um, you know, trauma and its role in all of this. And, and maybe, you know, eventually, you know, getting an interview, getting help finding jobs is what, like the first step. But I think, could we bring that into VR in some ways uh, eventually once some of these technologies are farther along and, and make it um, something that's, you know, a lot more widespread because, and what I like about this technology too, as a workforce person, I have to say is that I see a lot of duplication and a lot of repeating of wheels in every single state, in every single facility, recreating the same wheel instead of just making something good, testing it and making sure that more people can use it. And I love the idea of being able to really vet something and have something really quality and then being able to provide a lot more variety of options to a lot more people because you know I might be wanting to go into healthcare I might want to be going into construction and like that pathway might be really different and nobody has the resources to build out a full program for any of that but what could you do if you actually could scale it um, and that includes things like CBT so anyway I, I know that we are really hitting up against time here so I'm going to Call it off. I don't know, Connor, if you have any closing thoughts. I don't want to cut you off at all. But um. I, I was just going to say, the, so you know, the virtual reality portion for, for incarcerated individuals is just one part of a, of a whole system that needs to be addressed. Um, individuals that are returning to society aren't just coming to the workplace. They're coming back to their families. Uh, they're coming into a society where they have to deal with, um, with officers. Um, we, we began this uh, virtual reality program to address officers' behaviors towards individuals. Um, we're expanding that. Prisons is the next step. Uh, this can go so many more places. Uh, we want to address people's biases, behaviors, feelings, and situations uh, across the board, not just here. Great. Well, thank you very much for coming tonight. It's a beautiful evening out there, and I hope that you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.